Check, check. One, two. Hello, everyone. I'm Big T. I'm from Barulula. And this song is called Grateful. Feel free to clap along. And yeah, hope you enjoy. From the start to the finish, my friend. From the beginning to the end. Reppin' from the hardest, no easy task. Do what you gotta do, and it'll last. Keep moving forward, never looking back into the past. Cause it will just be a distraction. Attacking your mental action. If you find some help for yourself, then you'll feel the satisfaction. Coming back in, then you'll make things happen. Now I got everybody here bobbing along to my song. This is young man from BLA, aka Boralula. I got something to say. Everything is going good, gotta find a way to. Thank God, so I pray for the food on my plate every night and day And for the warm bed and the roof that's over my head I said what I said, yes I have dreams, I'm not ashamed Don't take us with the same brush, we are not the ones to blame We are here to make a change that's happening around us Cause the bad vibe is surrounding us, trying to brainwash all of us Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end I remember I was hungry cause my family was always struggling and budging for money Always broke, always used to hope my family would stop Wasting money on humble substance like alcohol and smoke show My mom would always tell me not to do that, to do this as a kid Now look on me now, standing in front of the crowd saying the words that laugh Then my family must be really proud of what a man I've become Especially dad and mom That they had a son that grew up Not a screw up That had fun Even though we didn't have none Sometimes it be a hassle But kids gotta be careful Most of the nights I played Swiss in that fool But I was always grateful To get food To stop the rumbling And I stop make at least It was something So better than nothing To stop your fussing Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Showing love to my supporters and fans Because I know how it feels to be ignored, embarrassed After all, sharing is caring From the darkness I'm emerging Searching for the lonely and broken, healing the ones that be hurting, trying to seek attention, trying to seek affection, that's your only intentions, it's the only interaction with the world that we living in, some say that rapping comes naturally, while I just rap casually, they don't know I'm struggling, but I'ma keep hustling, as long as I'm grinding, my heart gon' keep shining, cry later, don't forget to keep laughing, so I can keep this comforting songs coming, you know Big T, keep it PG, ain't no need for cussing, I will never Stop loving Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family, grateful for my friends Grateful for the love, I will hold it to the end Grateful for my family Grateful for my friends Grateful for my family Grateful for my friends Grateful for my family Grateful for my friends Grateful for the love And I will hold it to the end Thank you Good morning Welcome back to your Hi everyone, welcome to Tuesday's lesson in maths for year 788. And I'm I'm Mr. Max and this is <laughs> this is Miss Pam very impressively skipping. Why am I skipping? Well, today we are learning about skip counting. Seven, eight. I think I've done a hundred, Mr. Max. <laughs> I'm pooped. So yeah, by now you should have a pretty good idea about counting and skipping is a great way to practice so if you have a skipping rope at home have a go and you'll be worn out like me before long that's right okay now yesterday we talked about place value and we got so carried away about that that we didn't finish some of our workbook tasks 
So right now, Mr. Max is going to sit down mm. and show you in our workbooks what we're going to do today. First of all, in our workbooks to finish that off before we get into adding and subtracting, as you can mm. see in the slideshow. The okay. first slide up there with the giraffe and his patterns. It's very cute, isn't he? Yes. Okay, back down to our workbooks now. You'll see two pages, numbers, numbers, and place value worksheet. Mm. So in numbers, numbers, what we are doing is learning about place value. So I'm going to go through an example. I'm going to do one from here, one from here, and two from here. Excellent. So... See, we have this number here, 1,754. And so we need to put it into the right columns. The one stands for 1,000, goes into the thousands column. Mm -hmm. The seven stands for seven hundreds, goes into the hundreds column. The five stands for 50, goes into the tens column. And then the four stands for four, goes into the ones column. 1,754. Pretty easy now, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, try the other ones on your own. The next one is draw a line to match the numbers to the words. So we've got the numbers on the left and we've got it broken up into the different thousands, hundreds, tens and ones on the right and we need to match them up. So here we have the number 2,328, which is two thousands three hundreds, two tens and eight ones. So we put a line between them. Oh, that's a nice easy one, Mr. Max, isn't it? Yes, it is. And moving on to the other worksheet we have is called the place value worksheet. Um, and in this worksheet, you have to circle the numbers that are in the different columns. So for example, in this one, we have to circle the numbers that have a six in the ones place. So let's look through the numbers. Does this have a six in the ones place? Yes, it does, right there. We circle this one. This one doesn't have a six at all. This one has a six in the ones place as well. Um, now, how about this one? This one has a six, but is it in the ones place, Ms. Pam? Um, no, but what, one, what, what would it be if it's not in the ones? What mm. would we call that one? Well, because it's the third one along from the right, it's the hundreds place. Ah. So it's, it's not one of the answers mm -hmm. and the same for this one the six is in the tens place so it's also not right but this one has six in the ones place so once again we circle that one six in the thousands and hundreds not in the ones six in the hundreds in the wrong in place. the tens and thousands mm -hmm. and this one doesn't have a six at all so right. there you go try those ones on your own Okay, fabulous. Mm -hmm. Now, next slide is a reminder about our times tables. Now, Mr. Max is going to explain to you how we check. Now, you won't have this in your workbook, but we're just going to go over it with you to remind you about our grouping. Now, we did lots of work on grouping last week, but we're going to use that times table to do all of our adding and subtracting mm. in the next section. So just looking down now, Mr. Max will explain to you what these little beetles are doing on this leaf. Mm -hmm. So as you can see, there are five, um, six actually, six beetles on the leaf. And each beetle has three spots each. And so what we want to find out is how many spots are on one leaf in total. Now it would take a really long time if we were to count the spots one by one. So we could count them one, two, three, four, and so on. So what we do is we use multiplication to find them. And now we know that there are six beetles. That's why there's a six there. And there are three spots on each beetle. So we put a three there. So we've basically got six groups of three. And from our times tables, we know that six times three is 18. That's why it's good to know our times tables because then we can do these sorts of things very quickly without having to count them um, one by one. So wow. give them a go on your own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fabulous. Now we're going to have a look at our finished times table. And if you have done this correctly, then you've done a great job. Mm. Maybe you could get somebody else to help check them with you to make mm -hmm. sure that they're right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And this is really important to know. If you can memorize these, That'll be really good for you. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
Now, Mr. Max, can you show me a pattern that might be happening in there for everyone to have a look at? Maybe we just pick a pattern in, say, the four times table. Mm. What do we have to do to our four times table? So here we've got our four times table. I'll show you where that is. There's one, it runs this way, mm -hmm. and the other fours run this way, so it's the same as you can see. Now, okay. notice that when you have your fours, it goes four, plus four is eight, plus four is 12, plus four is 16, plus four is 20, ah, and onwards. see, so we're adding four to every number before. That's right. And we get the right answer in the next square. Hmm. Yeah. And, and, and what we end up happening is if we do these often enough, then we, we can remember them so that we don't actually have to add them. We just know straight away. If I say four times four, then you know that's 16. Right, fantastic. Mm -hmm. So when they've done them right, we can give ourselves a pat on the back. Well done, times table award for you if you've finished already. That's right. Now you might have done these last week. If you haven't done them in your workbook, then you're lagging behind. And you can go over those lessons on the YouTube and, uh, and re-watch them and get your times table finished so that we can move on to the next exciting part of our maths lessons in addition and subtraction. Mm. Now, in your workbooks after that, we have a section called Essential Maths, Essential Assessment. And some of you who were with us last year at Urara College might have done this in the computer under the same heading. And I know if you're in Mr. Lico's class or Mr. Michael's class or my class, you would have done some essential maths on the computer. So we're gonna have a look at these exercises now that are hard copies of the same uh, maths that we were doing before on the computer. And Mr. Max is gonna give you an example of, of some of the questions and answers mm. before the end of the session today. Okay, so the first question reads, fill in the missing numbers in each number pattern. So have a look, I'm gonna show you how to do A. So the pattern starts two, four, six. And we have to think about that. Um, what is the pattern that is happening there? Mr. Um, Max, maybe I can count, skip. Yeah. Skip count. Skip count. And show them. That's Let's right. do that. Let's We're do that. We're starting with what number? We're starting with two. Two, we want two more skips. We've got two skips. One, two. How many skips all together? That's two skips. That's two. We started with two. Start like, with can two. We start from the beginning. We go to four. Three, four. Mm -hmm. Okay. Five, six, seven, eight. I eight. jumped in four then, didn't I? There you go. Mm. But so eight. we're going two and four and six and eight. Mm -hmm. And if we add two to eight, what do we get, Miss Pam? Hang on. Let me count. Nine and ten. The next two. Let me do a fancy one. Eleven and twelve. And the final one. I'm going to do a backwards one now. Yeah? Yep, okay. getting fancy. Thirteen, fourteen. That's right. What Lots about a big... Skipping. I'm going to do a different one now. One more, let's do another one. One more, okay. You want to do the fives? Okay then, that's a lot more skipping, but I think right. I can do it. Okay. What do you reckon? All right. Let's five, go. Five. <laughs> One, two, oh, hang on, sorry. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five. Then 10. Six. <laughs> Six, seven, eight, nine, 10. And then 15. 11, oh, that first one was not a good it's one. Slipping up. <laughs> 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Right, I think we'll <sighs> Miss leave. Pam's getting fit. I think now we'll, we'll, we'll move to the mental Side <laughs> Before you wear <laughs> Miss Pam out. <laughs> yeah. So we have 5, uh, 10, 15. I'm getting fit. Add 5, 20. Add 5, 25. Add 5, 30. 30. And then 35. 35, 40, 45, 50. And there so on. So that's a nice easy one too. That's right. So I finish reckon. those off. And if you have a look through the rest of the questions, they're fairly similar. Um, in, in this one, in fluency, we're using um, shapes instead of numbers. So you've mm. got three circles here, four circles here. You'll have five circles, six circles, seven circles. Give that a go. Okay. You then have your problem solving here. You've got dots or circles. 
and you've got the number underneath. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dots, eight there. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Wow. Twelve there. Do you know what, going. Mr. Max? There's four pages of That's that. That's right. We better if get going. Just give them a flick through those. There's lots of work you can do at home on this yourself if you're game, mm -hmm. or you can wait until tomorrow and we'll go over these last few sheets. But I really think that by now you're getting so good at place value and skip counting and grouping numbers, you're going to have no problem finishing these sheets. That's right. We're going to go now. I think that's the end of our session, <laughs> Mr. Max. That's right. That's and right. Uh, you can work as hard as you like on those next few sheets and we'll go over them again in the morning, all right? Mm -hmm. Or tomorrow afternoon, I mean, sorry. That's right. So goodbye for now. Thank you for tuning in again today. Thank Bye you. Bye from Miss Pam. Keep skipping. Keep skipping, <laughs> but don't skip too much. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. G'day everybody, it's Miss Pam and Mr Keegan back for an integrated learning lesson for Tuesday, February. What year is it? 2022. 20? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we're introducing uh, today's lesson with where we left off yesterday because we had a kind of a, a lesson that talked about uh, natural features of Australia. Uh, today we're going to go over those details a little bit and show lots more uh, lovely pictures and things that are included in emblems and flags in Australia and we'll be moving on from there. So today Mr Keegan firstly is going to just show you the Australian plants, animals, landmarks and famous Australians that are in your workbook task. This is the task sheet that we semi-completed yesterday and we're going to go over it a bit more today. Uh, one of the plants that we went over was the Sturt Desert Pea, which was the, the red plant that we saw on the board yesterday. 
And a few of the animals were the Tasmanian devil, the wombat, cassowary, thorny devil, echidna and koala. And there's a lot more that you might like to add there too. Australian landmarks. Okay. Let's have a little look through the first couple of slides. There, we have some beautiful, unique flowers. Let's just talk about, just quickly before we go too much further, because we've talked about plants and animals, we'll give you the definition, firstly, of flora and fauna, which is the proper name for plants and animals. And the flora is the definition of, and we'll go back, sorry, can we just go back to that slide? The uh, definition of flora is the plants that are living in a particular area or region of Australia. So we call that the flora of Northern Territory or Australian flora, which is unique and different to the rest of the world. Uh, fauna is the word that we give to the animals that live that are unique to an area. And in Australia, we have lots of unique animals as we saw in a few of those pictures that we just spoke of. Okay, so the next slide will show you uh, a close-up example of how those specific flowers, these particular flowers, are used in emblems and other ways in Australia, like looking at uh, stamps and um, lots of uh, government documents have emblems stamped onto them. And that's what we'll be getting to, but we're gonna go back to Australian landmarks now. So we've had a look at flora and fauna and Australian landmarks are either natural or man-made, aren't they? So we did have a look at Sydney Harbour Bridge, I think it was yesterday in one of the pictures, wasn't it? Sydney Harbour Bridge. Brisbane City. Um, the Brisbane City, the big skyscraper buildings. We have the Opera House. Um, most of the man-made structures end up being famous because of their architectural design, the things that make them different to other buildings and other places in the world. Now, natural Australian landmarks are places like Uluru because they're unique and they just pop out of the landscape. Wave Rock is another one. There's Karajini, there's waterholes, there's other special beautiful places like the Blue Mountains, Great Dividing Range, and lakes and rivers that people come all the way to Australia to have a look at. And each state has their own that they're very proud of. So Mr Keegan's writing a couple more down in the workbook. And I'm pretty sure he could remember a few good famous Australian people too to put in the next one. Famous Australian could be somebody who designed the unique building or it could be your favourite person, a footy star. I'm sure Mr Keegan's got a few of those, yeah. <laughs> Can you name a couple for us, Mr. Keegan? There would be a video that we saw in math the other week, Buddy Franklin. Ah, who's Buddy Franklin? He played for Hawthorne and he kicked lots of goals. We've got Kathy Freeman who went to the Olympics for Australia. Wow, well everybody knows Kathy Freeman's famous in Australia, we all love her. Another would be Cyril Rioli. Ah, I know that he was a footballer, am I right? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And who did he play for, Mr Keegan? He also played for Hawthorne. Oh, wow. Okay, so there's some names that you can put in the fourth section of your work page. Let's go to the next slide and look at different types of bush tucker. There's Kwandong. Now, I know that there are indigenous labels for all of these bush tuckers that we don't know the name of in language for some of them. But in Australia, we call this one Kwandong, and you might recognize that plant uh, and a lot of the bush tuckers um, also used as medicines and you guys know more about them than I do but they're a very interesting range of plants so the next slide shows us a little bit of those animals that we were looking at yesterday the Tasmanian devil a very interesting little creature and the thorny devil of course so we've all Tasmania has a devil and Northern Territory has a devil Now let's have a look at what an emblem means and then what a logo means. An emblem is a symbol that represents a state or a group of people or equality. An emblem is a picture that stands for something related to a subject, like government, for example. Logo, a logo is an emblem in which it stands for something, although it's usually a thing like sporting 
a sporting team or a company. So not always known in Australia. So the next page, Keegan's put this together with a few questions and answers which might be a little bit more fun for us. You read, Mr Keegan, oh. you can read that one. <laughs> <laughs> On the next few slides, we're going to look at different types of logos or emblems and you guys have to decide whether it's a logo or an emblem. Remember that a logo is used for mainly sporting teams and companies, whereas an emblem is used for states or groups of people. States so, or government, yeah. Let's have Gov a look. Departments, different departments. What is this? Is it a logo or an emblem? If we click again, we can see what it is. This ah. is a logo. It is the Philadelphia 76ers logo. And can you see the ball there? Is that circle? Does that mean that it's a ball? That is a ball. That's a basketball. Ah. Because they are a part of the NBA. Right. Which is a sporting team. That's how we know it's a logo. Right. Another one could be, is the New South Wales state emblem or logo? What is it? What do you think? This is an emblem. Ah. And because look, it there's represents a lion a state. in there. I wonder why there's a lion in there. A lion and a kangaroo. Hmm. We'll learn more about that soon. I think we have one more. Is this GWS Giants an emblem or a logo? Remember, mm. it's a sporting team, so what mm. would it be? I think it's a logo, Mr. Keegan. Let's find out. It, it is, is a logo, and it's the best team. <laughs> the best team, according to Mr. Keegan. <laughs> That's good. Okay, now if you go to your workbooks, Mr. Keegan's going to point out the pages in your workbook that you can work together on. If you can read, please read along with us. Mr. Keegan's going to read uh, in the boxes and uh, give you some more, more ideas about how we can put this together. As you can see on this page here, these ones here are all logos. They represent a sporting team or a company. Melbourne Demons, a sporting team. Los Angeles Lake is a sporting team. And the Broncos, a sporting team. Then we have Nike and Adidas, which are companies. And then we have the Indigenous All-Stars who just played over this past weekend. Now on this mm -hmm. other page, we can see some emblems, which represent a state, group of people, or quality. Remember, they stand for something related to a subject. So we have the bald eagle, which is an emblem for America. Mm -hmm. The white dove or green olive branch is seen as an emblem of peace. Wow. The fern is native plant and an emblem of New Zealand. The dragon is a popular em emblem that represents China. The red cross is an emblem used to represent help and protection. Mm -hmm. The golden wattle is the national flower and emblem of Australia. There are so many, Mr. Keegan, so many emblems. They're everywhere. They're on flags, they're on doorways, they're on signs. Now we come to the task for you guys to do yourselves in your workbooks. Ready? We're going to use these two pages here to try and work out the first few questions. Count and name the different animals you can see on the New South Wales state emblem. Mm. And if you can see on the screen here, this is the New South Wales state emblem. How many animals can we see? We'll just focus on the main ones. So we have one, two. There are two animals. We think one is what? A lion. A lion. And the other would be what? A kangaroo. But Mr. Keegan, there's no lions in New South Wales. Why would a lion be on there? Hmm? No idea. We'll find out. <laughs> I want to know the answer to that question. And which plant on the Victorian state emblem represents peace? I'm not sure the answer to that. It looks like she has a fern oh, in her hand. I think it's the fern. I remember Mr. Leco telling me that. I've given them the answer. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> we'll save the rest of these questions for you guys back at home. Okay. Well, that was a great lesson and we learned lots about emblems, the flowers and natural features and other features that go into an emblem or a logo. So now we know the difference. We've come to the end of a lesson, IL for today. And uh, we'd love to see you back again tomorrow to continue working. We've got lots of pictures and... Uh, questions and answers to go through so we know a lot more about our country. Okay, thanks for staying tuned. Bye. See ya.
Today we're going to be learning a couple of new chords and also we're going to be looking at learning your first song. Uh, remember, first things first, as soon as you pick up your guitar, you need to tune it. Uh, we talked about a clip-on tuner last time, which is one of these little fellas. And uh, very simple to use, just clip it onto the end of the guitar, the head, switch it on and then we can start tuning. That's a bit too low, that needs to come up. Okay, that's in tune. Next string is an A, that needs to come up again as well. Okay, that's in tune. The next one is a D. There we go. Yep. Yeah. Next one is a G. Yeah, that needs to come up too. Remember these tuning pegs on this side, they twist the opposite side, opposite way to the ones on the top there, so if it needs to come up, you twist it round to the right. Okay, that's in tune. Next one is a B. There we go. And the last one is E again. Right, okay. So, um, we're going to be looking at the chords A major, E major, D, and G today. So, uh, I think we looked at uh, A major last time, which is uh, squeezing three of your fingers all into the second fret. So, your index finger there on the D string, then your middle finger right underneath it, and then your ring finger right underneath that, so three in a row. And that's what that should sound like. All squeezed in between these two bars here into the second fret. Now the, the second chord we're looking at is an E major, so that involves your index finger on the first fret on the G, your middle finger on the second fret on the A, and then your ring finger right underneath that one on the D string in the second fret, and that should sound like this. Okay. Next chord is a D which involves your index finger on the G in the second fret, your middle finger down on the E string on the second fret, and then your ring finger on the third fret on the B string. And then you strum it starting on the D string. You don't do the top two strings. You start on the D string. Now sometimes when you're doing a chord that only involves these thinner strings down here and these ones are open, you can I mean, I don't think you're supposed to, but I do. You can kind of bend your thumb over just to mute those strings so that they don't ring out. Otherwise, it kind of sounds a bit out of tune and a bit messy. So if you mute it, you've got full movement of your strumming and you haven't got to worry about those strings spoiling the sound. Okay, and the last chord we're looking at today is a G which involves your index finger on the second fret on the A, your middle finger on the third fret on the E, and then using your two other fingers down here on the bottom two strings in the third fret. Okay, so you're using all four of your fingers for this one. And that's what that one should sound like. Okay. Now the song we're going to be looking at today, you may, you may not be familiar with, it's, a, um, it's an old song from, from when I was a kid that I used to listen to. Uh, it's called um, It's a Shame About Ray by a band called Lemonheads 
and it's from way back in the early 90s, but it's a great starting point for when you're learning these open chords. So um, the best way to start is to get used to the strum pattern. So, so get your A major chord ready, so the one that's three fingers in a row on the second fret, and you can just mute that top string there with, with your thumb. And the strum pattern goes like this. And notice my hand is striking the strings at different times. So, so there's two going down, and then the next one comes up. That's the pattern. And the tune goes like this. So you change from A major to E major to D. That's the first part of the song, and it goes like this. So you play those three chords once. So. Second round, you hit the G. And back to the G again. This is, uh, it, it might seem a bit difficult at first, but this is actually a song that I've taught in class at Urara to um, all, all different year levels, and um, most of the students have actually managed to accomplish playing this. So it can be done quite quickly. All you need to do is just start very slowly and just practice changing between chords. So, so when you change, you can kind of take all your fingers off and position them, go back down again. So you get that one one hit of all the strings open, so. And that gives you a chance just to get your fingers in the correct position. And, uh, and that about does it for today, so keep practicing. So that's A major, E major, D major, and G. So I'll play that through one more time for you. Thank you so much for watching, I'll see you again next time. Welcome everybody, this is me and my brothers who just kicking back in the studio. And this is dedicated to my Yanil and Garwa people. RTL and BLA, let's go! Keep on rocking! Keep on rocking! Friends and family come together! One big love in commentary! I'm a man, I am proud of who I am. I'm proud of who I am. Robinson, we keep it real. My hometown, we do not steal. Daniel Agaro, speak the truth. Barefoot warrior, don't need no boots. I'm not gammon, that's the truth. Come to my town to have a look. Big Baramandi's on the hook. Take it home for me to cook. I'm DK, I got something to say. From Robinson to BLA. Crazy fisherman from Savannah Way. Listen up, y'all, I got something to say. Keep on rocking. Keep on rocking. Friends and family come together. One big mouth and commentary. Keep on rocking. Keep on rocking. Friends and family come together. One big mouth and commentary. Riding around with the motorbike. Ain't going home till I see the moonlight. 
My name is Davis, they call me Lucy Making big dots when I'm drifting One, two, three and to the floor Bernie and Rango at your door Chosen on the beat, Toothy on the street S. Evans, Big T, Charlie Javis and Noah on the mic Sonny's out here, he busting the rhyme DK and Declan trying to get with ya Don't get it twisted, his name is Sylvester Throw your hands up now, give it everything Cause you know he's on the flow like Jaden King Fire like a cannon, you down with Shannon Borrow Lula Robinson, you know we ain't trippin' Good morning! Hey, hey. Welcome back to Urara. Hi and welcome to online learning for Year 9. My name is Miss Elizabeth and I teach in Year 9 and Year 10 classes. Firstly, I want to say thank you very much for showing up. You are making a strong decision about getting a good education simply by tuning in right now. We have been looking at some interesting patterns and numbers, and today we're going to try to put these together to solve some tricky maths problems. So, let's get started. Let's check out what we have in Year 9 Maths today. Thank you for tuning in. The introduction and welcome, come in and stay, listen and watch, the lesson is counting forwards on the number line, the do is using patterns for the table grid and to ask questions. Let's listen and watch. Today we will look at number lines and we will also use our hundreds grid to help us answer some of the questions. Numbers can be written on a number line. The arrow means the line keeps going. Let's look at the first number line. You can see the dots start at 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 and 35. Let's place these numbers onto our hundreds grid. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. Very good. Now the question is, on this number line we are counting by. So we need to figure out what size the jumps are or we need to figure out how many jumps are in between the numbers. So let's start at 5 and make our jumps towards 10. Great work. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 jumps and we get to 10. Very good. Let's check and see if this works for the next number. Over on to the next line is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Ah, very good. 5 jumps to get to 15. So on this number line, we are counting by 5 jumps. And each jump is 1 space. Great work. Well done. Let's look at our second question. And here we can see it starts at 8. So let's put these numbers onto our hundreds chart. And then on this number line we can work out what we are counting by. So let's start with 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, 48, and 56. Very good. Now we can jump from one number to the other. Let's start at 8. 1, 2, over the line, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Ah, 8 jumps to get from 8 to 16. Let's check the next one. 1, 2, 3, 4, over the line, 5, 6, 7, 8. Ah, this looks very promising. So on this number line, we are counting by 8 jumps. Very good. We can solve this pattern now. Now for a challenge. 
Let's look at question 3. These numbers are quite big. 25, 50, 75, 100, 125, 150 and 175. I don't think we can fit them all onto the hundreds chart. Let's see how many we can get. 25, 50, good work. Yes, there it is, 75 and 100. There's only four, but I think we can manage. So let's jump from 25 and see how many it takes to get to 50. And here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and over the line, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, over the line, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Ah, that's quite a few jumps, isn't it? Do you want to check one more time to be sure we've got the right number? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and over the line. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and over the line. 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Very good. So it looks as though... Here we are counting by 25 jumps. Very good. Ah, let's look at the next question. This is a little tricky for us. It doesn't look like a times table. But we'll follow the same rule that we were using before. And it asks, what is the next number on this number line? Hmm. So let's fill in the numbers that we can see already. We have 91, 95, 99, 103. Let's check our jumps. We have 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, let's check one more time. 1, 2, 3, 4. This is good. 1 over the line, 2, 3, 4. So, do you think you know the answer? Okay, here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4. Well done. The answer is 107. Good work. Wow. And question 5. Mm. Now these are very large numbers, like 672. But here's a little trick we can use. We can say that we've already counted up to 600, and we can use our hundreds chart as if we are counting on to 700. Have a little look and see as we fill it in. So we'll start with 600. Mm-hmm. And instead of 600, we'll write 601, 602, 603, 604, 605. See how sneaky it is? 606, 607, 608. And now I'm just filling it in. You can follow it down. If you want to slow up the tape, you're welcome to. But let's get to... 700. Awesome. Now, let's go back and see if we can solve this problem. Let's put the numbers onto the chart. Good work. So let's jump. 1, 2, 3. Ah, 3, 2, 3, 3. We'll keep going, two, three. Ah, there's the answer. 693. Well done. Great work. And now a couple of questions just to finish to see if we remember the words we learned last time. 
What is the number 3 before 15? So last time we were looking at counting forward and counting back. Counting on and counting back. So when we're looking at before something happens, we're looking at counting back. That's correct. 15 go back 3 is 12. Let's look at the next question. What is the next number 4 after 6? Well done, we are counting on. 4 after 6 is 10. Let's see how much progress we've made today. Introduction and welcome. Well done. If there are any problems, ask someone. Or best thing to do, go back onto YouTube or Facebook and watch it over so that you can get that pattern well in your head. Stay safe, stay strong and see you next time. Hello and welcome back. We are so pleased to see you. If this is your first day logging on, great. It's brilliant to have you here. Feel free to go back and watch the other episodes and go back in your workbook. And if you've been with us every day, brilliant job. Well done. We're so pleased. Today, we're going to read a few sentences. We're going to listen to Ruben talk about Bush Tucker. And then we're going to turn to page 11 in our workbooks. Let's go. Pieces to fill in. Words at the bottom. We've got fat, eaten, rivers, emu, crabs, hunters, echidnas, and fire. So let's read the sentences and see where the words might fit. So bush tucker. Aboriginal people have long been known as extremely good something who took advantage of all the wildlife which surrounded them and learned to make the most of every animal they killed. Aboriginal people have long been known as extremely good fat, eaten, rivers, emu, crabs, hunters, yeah I think so, hunters, let's make it black. Okay, the two animals on Australia's coat of arms, the something and the kangaroo, are a favourite of hunters as they are both high in protein and low in something else. Okay, so the two animals on Australia's coat of arms, can you picture it? One of them is a kangaroo and the other one is, let's cross that, hunters. Yeah, you got it. It's definitely an emu. Let's write it in in black. So what are they both high in? They're both high in protein and low in it's another type of thing that you eat. Yeah, you got it. Fat. They're both high in protein and low in fat. The meat is traditionally cooked over an open something pit or by steaming it in a fire pit. So what's it cooked over? An open eaten, an open rivers, an open crabs, an open echidnas, or an open fire pit? Yeah, I know, you got it faster than me. Fire. Let's change it to black to write it. Fire pit. Okay. Let's go back to yellow for tracking. Other land animals which are commonly hunted and something include goannas, snakes, crocodiles, wallabies, turtles and something else. So other land animals which are commonly hunted and hunted and eaten? Yeah, that would make sense. Hunted and eaten. Include goannas, snakes, crocodiles, wallabies, turtles, and what's another animal that's commonly hunted and eaten? Well, I know crabs are. 
but it's not a land animal. Yeah, echidnas. Aboriginal people also fish in the oceans and some think. Get rid of echidnas, oceans and, oceans and you got it, rivers to get their protein. Mud, some think, and barramundi are easy to catch and make a delicious meal. Okay, so what are we catching in the oceans and rivers? We've done rivers. Yeah, this last word here, mud crabs. Let's write it in, C-R-A-B-S. And barramundi are easy to catch and make a delicious meal. Let's read the whole thing through. I will use this so it's easier to follow. Bush Tucker. Aboriginal people have long been known as extremely good hunters, or oh, sorry, who took advantage of all the wildlife which surrounded them and learned to make the most of every animal they killed. Should we make that a little bit smaller? It's as big as it's gonna be. Every animal they killed. The two animals on Australia's coat of arms, the emu and the kangaroo, are a favourite of hunters as they are both high in protein and low in fat. The meat is traditionally cooked over an open fire pit or by steaming it in a fire pit. Other land animals which are commonly hunted and eaten include guanas, snakes, crocodiles, wallabies, turtles and echidnas. Aboriginal people also fish in the oceans and rivers to get their protein. Mud crabs and barramundi are easy to catch and make a delicious meal. Okay, thanks for reading along with us. Well done for filling in the blanks. Great job. Yep, all these spiky ones, they're 50,000 plus. They're from the megafauna period. Um, these weighty woods, they're actually classed as a plant we're going to lose. They're threatened. They're on the threatened list. A lot of the areas that they're in are actually fenced off solely to not let anyone at them or fires at them at all. But the weighty wood has protected themselves against the megafauna. The megafauna were grass eaters or tree eaters. This tree turned its bottom leaves into needles. So any big megafauna lips trying to grab them, we're normally getting staked by those needle shaped leaves. But when you go halfway up the tree or a bit further, the leaves go soft because the tree worked out how tall those animals are. Smart tree and threatened as well, weighty woods. Oh yeah, big threatened list now. We're losing them and we could lose them in one hit. So we've got to be real careful for those ones. All of these trees with a beautiful purple flower are the bush tomato. You'd look at that tomato and you'd go, oh my God, that looks so nice. But this is one of those 19 different type of bush tomato you're not getting. Well, how I've talked to a tourist to tell them the one to look for, these are standing up. The ones that you're gonna eat are the ones at a ground cover. It's like a crawler or a creeper. These, as you can see, are not creeping or crawling. So you don't want to have this because this could burn your mouth, burn your throat, burn your belly, and then burn your bottom as it's coming out. So you must never ever eat this one here. Make sure you know which one before you actually eat a lot of bush tucker. And make sure you're not allergic to food too because you could get very sick. But yeah, bush tomato, but hopefully I'll be able to show you the bush tomato that you actually this eat. This one are red mulgars. So when we went through earlier, we showed you that difference between the witchetty bush, which is an acacia, and the mulga, which is an acacia. But I told you there were several different types of, of mulga. This one here is it's a funny one. It looks like someone shaved all the bark up. This is commonly red mulga. So it's another acacia, another hardwood. So you could use basically for tools and stuff like that. But yeah, a beautiful wood as well. Beautiful tree. That's your mulga, red mulga though.
Hi everyone, it's Kay- Miss Kamisha. Um, today we're going to be turning to page 11 in our IL booklets and we've got just three questions to answer about some bush tucker. I've ha- helped out by answering some questions for you. Um, the first one we've got, what is bush tucker? I've just wrote, bush tucker is also called bush foods. It is native in our country, meaning that it is used a lot in our country and our people have survived off of it for many years. The next question is, where do I find it? In your community, you could find bush tucker all over the place. However, in the central Oz region, we usually go hunting out on homelands or pretty much in our own backyards. Um, If you're from the top end, which we've got some students, they might go hunting on a boat, spearing, um, down in the river. It'd be exciting to know where you find your bush tucker and how you find it, since everywhere is different. Then we've got the last question is, who do I go with to find um, where I'm from? I go hunting with my older cousins or my dad, just for kangaroo. Um, But if I'm down in South Australia with my own, with my mum's family, I usually go hunting on the boat or I go fishing. Um, Tell me where, tell me where and who you go with to find your bush tucker. Oh, hey there, middle school. How are you today? It's so good that you can join me. I hope that you enjoyed last week's episode. But today, we're doing something a little bit different. It's a little bit of a, a hunt, if you might want to join me. So today I'm at the beach, and I overheard some conversation the other day that some pirates lost some treasure. Do you think you can help me find it? You can? Fantastic. Let's go. Thank you so much for coming down, guys. I really need your help to find this treasure. Okay, so last week we discussed how to read a map, how we find the coordinates and how we follow a map to a certain location. So we're gonna continue on with that idea of using a map or a grid, and we're gonna find our treasure. On your workbooks, you will have a sheet that looks like this. It has an island and it's a map. We have to find our way to our treasure from the start point. So we're gonna do this up on the board here. So we have our start point here. We're gonna try and find three locations. We're gonna try and find the triangle, the circle, and the square. So I know this seems a little basic, or even a little just simplistic. However, coding a robot follows on from these basics. They don't see the same way that we do. They see the world in a different perspective, similar to this grid. And so a lot of you have done Scratch before, and Scratch is all based upon a grid, where you place things and how it finds its way to the next spot. So that's what we're working on, trying to get our robot from one point to the other. But we're starting off with simple coding to get our head around how it works. So let's start off with finding the circle. I'm gonna give you 20 seconds to think how many spaces left, right, forward do you need to go to get to the circle? Have a think. All right, so circle. So I start in here and we go one, two, three, four, so. The circle equals one, two, three, four, and then to the right. So if you follow this coding, these arrows, you will get to the circle with no problem. So let's try it again with the triangle. Have a shot. Let's figure this out. There's a, there's a few ways you can go. So if you didn't go the same way that I do, that's perfectly fine. You guys are doing a great job. And if you figure it out, great work. So, with the triangle, let's go left. Let's try. So, one, two, three. 
one, two, three, and then one, two, three. Three up arrows. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, the last one is the square. What do you guys think? Have a shot. Doesn't matter which way you go. All right, good work. So there, there are many ways you can go. You can go along the bottom, you can go up, you can even go all the way around the map. It's up to you how you want to go. But often we want the quickest, most efficient route. Efficiency is using less energy, less effort to get something done. So, question, is it more efficient to go up here and around, or just to cut through down here? What do you think? For those of you who said down here, you are correct. That is the most efficient way. It's not the only way, but we're talking about efficiency. So, let's get the square. So we're going one, two, three, four, five arrows to the left. And then one arrow up. Okay, absolutely fantastic guys, great work. On our worksheet, we're gonna find these three items together. Let's give it a shot. The first one is the hook. That is located up here, located up here. So let's have a think about how we're gonna get there. We're thinking about the most efficient way. I'm thinking you can go one, two, three, four, five arrows up, and then one arrow to the left. Do you think you can write that down here? So five arrows up, and one arrow to the left. All right, here's a bit of an easy one. The hat. We need a few seconds to think, how are we gonna get there? What arrows are we gonna to use to get to the hat? All right, let's take a look. So we've got one, two, three. That's three arrows to the left, three of these. So you wanna write that down here? Three arrows. Doing absolutely fantastic, everybody. All right, last one. He's a little bit more tricky. The parrot, right here. So, what do you think is gonna be the easiest way to get to the parrot? So we go one, two, three, four. So four paces to the left, and then one, two, two paces up. We can write that down. So four to the left and two up. You guys are absolutely amazing. Now, as a little bit of a extra extension for you, if you turn the page over, we have another one. We have another map. So I wanna see if you guys can do this at home by yourself. So, not the same map, it's a little bit different. But we're finding three different things. The treasure chest, the parrot, and the hook. So, what they'll look like is we're finding the treasure chest, the parrot, and the hook. Do you think you can get that done? Well, next time, you can let me know. You guys are absolutely fantastic, and it's been great being with you. You guys enjoy the rest of your week, and I'll see you next time. To my brothers out there that's struggling, hustling, keep your head up, cause we do care. I know you're fed up, just keep your head up, just keep your head up. Yeah. To my brothers out there that's struggling, hustling, keep your head up, cause we do care. I know you're fed up, just keep your head up, just keep your head up.
I woke up one day And I'm feeling truly blessed With this life I got to live Put my hand on my chest Breaking for the best Living in the moment That's the truth While well, I'm telling you Get it too You know That's how we do it To my brothers and my cousins I'm the struggle Listen From the waves For the future And the body distant Keep the faith Make a change Reach for the star Put it up Hold it down While I spit this boss In this time Good afternoon everyone, Miss Andrea here with your Year 10 Maths and today we're doing something a little different, we're doing fruit plates. We're buying fruit or pretending that we're going to buy some fruit and then we're going to add up the costs. So before we started I thought what are your favourite fruits and where do you find them? Out bush or in town? Now, I suspected maybe some of your favourite fruits come from the bush. So, let's have a look at the slide there. And they're listing some of these. And do you eat any of them? Wild passion fruit, bush tomato, conker berry, mistletoe, bush banana and bush coconut, quandongs, pencil yams, mulga apple, bush plums and sultanas. That sounds beautiful and I can't wait to get out there and try some of that fruit, really. Now the next slide shows you red bush apples from Maningrida. They're locally known as jaduk. Is that how you say it? I hope I haven't got it wrong. Now these bush foods are used in Melbourne in a restaurant and the chef down there loves them. He says the jaduk has such a complex flavour, a deep flavour. It's slightly acidic, it's quite sweet, but it's complex. It has a hint of eucalypt about it, it's fragment and looks insanely beautiful. How does that sound? Fancy a fruit looking so beautiful. The next one I thought you might eat would be billy goat plum. The small fruit is common from northwestern Australia to East Arnhem Land where it is called Marunga. This fruit has more than 50 times more ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, than citrus fruit. So over in the West, when we're always eating oranges, well, we should be eating the billy goat plum because it's 50 times fuller of the vitamin C vitamin for colds. Now, the next one is green plum. Oh, that's hard to say. I'm sorry if I've got that wrong. You can tell me when you come back. Now, they say this is one of the tastiest bush fruits in the top end, and it's from the mango family. That's funny, isn't it, because it's so tiny. And people can use a stone to crush the fruit into a paste to feed older and younger people with less teeth. That's nice, so everyone gets to eat it. The last one I researched was the bush apricot. Now this is found in the rainforest and riverine margins in the top end. The skin of the seed pod and the fleshy inner can be eaten and the taste is said to be similar to an apricot. This can be eaten off the trees. So that's funny, isn't it? Because apricots are orange and these are really red and they don't look anywhere as soft. Have I talked about any of your favorite fruits? I don't know, but when you come back, tell me about them and maybe we can go out and find some. Now, the next thing I want to do is a live demonstration of fruit cutting techniques for the fruit plates we're going to talk about later. Now, I'm, I'm quite confident with doing this because before I became a teacher, I was a chef and I was doing this day in and day out. So let's have a close little look. You'll just be watching my hand and the board. So the first thing to do, because I haven't got a sink to wash my hands carefully, is to put these gloves on, which is easier said than done. Oh no, I've busted them already. Oh no, again. Oh, well, I just have to pull that bit off. All right. Might be hard to use my knives with a busted glove. So you can see the oranges there. And the first one there, has the top and the bottom already cut off. I started this one earlier, so let's move that aside. Now I'm going to make an orange crown. Now when you're cooking, 
You can use a variety of knives. So I've got two of my favourite knives here and this is the one that will be good for the orange. So you push it hard in here and make a triangular shape and it's got to go all the way through because I'm going to pull this orange apart any second now. There we go, the nice triangular shapes. And if I'm lucky, it's going to match up with this last cut, which is there. Now what I've done, and I've pulled it apart, here we go, is I've made an orange crown. In fact, I've got two. So I'll put them out of the way because we're going to go on with something else. Now the next thing I want to show you how to do is to make orange wedges. Now normally people cut the orange this way. Well, in the industry we know it's better to cut it this way, like you're going to juice the orange, pull it apart, and then cut it into wedges. Now this is nice because you can see how clean it is there. It hasn't got any of that white chewy stuff on it. So there we go. We've got those ready for our platter, our fruit plate, and we'll put this aside. Now the last little one, this is really only for fancy people, but I'm going to show you how to do it anyway. Now see how I'm using the knife to go round and get all that white stuff off the orange. Very juicy. Ooh, that has to come off. I'll go over this side where I've done a better job because we don't want to be doing this all afternoon. Now with this one, you put your knife in beside the hard bits and you get lovely little soft orange pieces like that. I'm going to put this over here and just do two more for our fruit plate in on the side and in there for a nice little soft orange piece and that's enough because we don't want to go too long when you're cooking you need to clean up all the time so I'm going to clean my knives and I've got no sink as you know because I'm in the studio I'm going to take this away and do the last little bit, which is to put our fruit plate together. How does that look clean enough for you? A little bit there. Now, I'm going to do a big one because we've got this big orange garnish. And I know you like grapes, so we're going to put a few little grapes on there for you. Have you eaten these before? Mulberries, beautiful. They're my favourite. Now, one thing I've forgotten to do is cut up the banana, so let's move that aside and quickly do the banana. I'll be using this knife. Now, I'm going to do fairly big pieces, and to make it more beautiful, cut across the banana like that. Now, we can put that back on the platter, spread it out a bit, right, and then the last thing we put on is a couple of those little orange bits, do you think they'll look nice on the, against the black there, and then chefs use something which is called garnish, and that's an edible leaf or flower, so I'm going to put the flower there. Clean up now. And there's your beautiful plate. Would you eat that? I hope you would. Okay, us in the studio will share that in a minute. Now I'll go back to the real work. Okay, we're looking at the next slide. Thanks, Miss Rebecca. Fruit is very good for healthy living and these fruits make delicious fruit salad plates. So we've had a look at the different fruit you might get here and I haven't used 
any bush fruit now because we really can't buy them easily. So most fruit you buy per kilo, as you probably already know, and we've got the prices there. So if you're going to make a fruit platter for a lot of people, you want to guess how much to buy and how much it will cost. So I'm coming back to the desk here. I'm going to move the fruit aside. And have a look at the worksheet. Okay. Work out how much it will cost to buy ingredients for the fruit salad plates. So, we looked here, you'll refer back to the worksheet with all your prices. And now we'll go back to the worksheet here and have a look at it. So, if we were going to buy five kilos of apples and the cost was a dollar a bag, it's simple multiplication, five times a dollar is five dollars. We're going to get two kilos of peaches, they're a dollar a kilo, two times one dollar, two dollars. Now when you're doing your maths, always remember to keep everything in line together so when you add it up, you can go straight down and get your total for the, all of the items. Now the next question on your worksheet, I'm sorry this is getting a bit wet, the shopping bags can only carry 25 kilos. Will the fruit fit into the shopping bags? So let's go back to the table on the worksheet and check that we've added all the kilograms together. See, this is where you'll do this. You'll add them all together. 5, 7, 9, 11, 14, 17, 22 kilos. The question is, Will 22 kilos fit in the shopping bag? Yes, we're done. We can carry them all home safely. And the last part of your worksheet, question three, how much will it cost for double the amount of fruit? What does double mean? Twice as much, two times, or multiply by two? So we're going to write the costs that we got on the other worksheet we're going to times it by two, write your sum out here and get your total. And then you'll be able to give a final answer to that question. Okay, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that. Let me give you another little sneak fruit, peek at the fruit. And I'd like to thank you for listening and I can't wait till you get back. Bye for now.
Good afternoon, all you wonderful people out there. Back to integrated learning. Back with me for the last time this week. From tomorrow onwards, I'll be doing some maths. That's going to be fun, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so integrated learning today. And a high five to all wonderful people again, for those that's out there listening and watching. Um, today, we're going to continue our topic on employability skills. Now, yesterday, um, I spoke about trees and leaves and roots, and I'm not quite sure if you actually remember all of those things. So, Mr. Dave said, you know what, I'll do another little spiel on it, and let's have a listen on Mr. Dave's take on the tree, the roots, the leaves, and the employability skills. Enjoy. This fellow was talking about employability skills yesterday. I wonder what she meant. I guess the fundamentals are the roots of the tree. How I work and the important elements to get the tree to grow. How I talk, how I calculate, and how I think will grow my future tree. If I work hard on the fundamentals, my roots will spread and stabilize the tree. The tree trunk will be the things I can take control of and how I will come to make a difference and become good at my job. Being positive, being responsible and working safely. They are like the roots. They're, they're the same, they are the same tree, but they will grow at the same time as I grow. Like the tree trunk. Then the tree grows and I adapt and I will learn teamwork skills. I can work better with people, I listen better, and I can use my roots and trunk to support others and work in a team. I guess, if helping by, I guess by helping people, my tree will grow leaves and flowers, and I will begin to grow as a person and as a team member. Miss Flo is right. My employability is like this tree. You know what? I'm going to try and grow into the tallest tree in the forest. Okay, I hope you understand the tree and let's hope all of us are trees that wants to grow tall. How does this look like in real life? Yes, we talk about punctuality, we talk about being responsible and all of these wonderful things. But how does it look like in real life when people work? Mr. Dave and I went on a little hunt and asked a few staff members how they use their employability skills in their jobs. Let's hear what they have to say. Yesterday, I spoke about employability skills. Let's hear how some of the staff at school use these skills in their everyday life. Communication is important because I need teachers and LSOs to be able to do their jobs properly. Numbers are very important in my job because numbers are in many things. For example, we have to account for how many kids are in at the moment. We have to account for funding. Uh, we have to account for things like how many pencils there are, for example. Um, all sorts of things like that. That's, that's where numbers are relevant. Critical thinking is really important um, in my and my team's line of work because often we've got to quickly think of solutions to various problems that come up when we're live streaming and we don't often have the time to sit down and calmly go through our options and we've got to really think on the spot. Our positive attitude is important as a teacher because um, as a teacher we work with a lot of young people and we uh, need to be role models and show a positive attitude so that others can follow in those footsteps. Um, it's also really important when you're working with others because um, especially with other staff you want to help support each other, be positive, um, feed off each other and, and work together and if, if someone's being quite negative and bringing others down, it, it can be really hard to do our job um, and to bring fun and humour and um, do our best. 
Being responsible in my job is important because it means that you are shown maturity so that they know you're not going to mess around but you're going to get your work done. It means knowing that you're going to do what you say you're going to do. If you say I'm going to get this done, that you're going to get it done and it means making sure that you, yeah, you do your work. Hi, so I've just returned from Rural Ops with a few of our students and they did some weeding today and to do that they used some personal some personal protective equipment like gloves and goggles and long sleeve shirts and long pants and a hat to keep themselves safe from the heat any snakes or bad things that might be in their long grass over there and keep others safe too It's really important in any environment to be a really good team worker. Everyone needs to work together to get things done. It's about sharing the load and responsibility and considering others. And the best things that happen in any work environment is when everyone works together as a team to get the desired result. Hey guys, my name's Sam. I've just started in student support and I wanted to talk to you today about why listening and supporting is really important in my role. So I really need to listen in my role so I can understand you guys, the students, to see what um, support that you might need from me or why you're f feeling a particular type of way. So it's really important for me to listen to you so I can understand. Um, supporting is really important in my role because it makes sure that you guys can continue to be at school and engaged in your education and continue to learn. So that is a big part of our student support team. Well, I hope you enjoyed watching all the staff members and hearing their take on employability skills. Right now, it's going to be your turn. And we're going to look into your workbook and you're going to go to page eight and page nine. And we are going to match your slide from yesterday. It says use the table in your booklet on employability skills from yesterday. And you need to match the pictures with what you think it is. Now we have done three for you. We've done communication, we have done using numbers, and we have done responsibility. So we looked at those pictures and we matched them with communication, chatting with one another, using numbers when planning, and taking responsibility when you're back in boarding, your clothes at home, clean, keeping your room clean and tidy. Um, your job is to complete the rest of the worksheet. And that, dear people, is the end of employability skills. Next time you see me, we will be doing some maths. So, TTFN in the wonderful words of Tigger. Bye-bye. Uh, it's the Clontarf crew, some of us, uncle and I, just wanted to say hello. Hope you're well, back at your communities. Yes, we are, all staff at Urara College are missing you. And hope you are well and staying safe. Take care and hope to see you soon. Being safe and well out on community. I know the start of this year doesn't look like we were all expecting it to look, but uh, you've got a great opportunity now with this live streaming to get in ahead of your education and be ready to rock and roll in the classroom and on the field of dreams with the Urara Brumbies when we're back on campus. I uh, hope you're all looking after each other. I hope you're, ex you're as excited to get back here as we are to have you. And um, look after each other, wash those hands, do everything you need to do to stay safe. And we'll be ready and waiting when you get back to make 2022 a real winner. No, you're not on campus yet, fellas. But... If you still kick goals, put your R to you.
you ain't ready you ain't ready you ain't ready you ain't you, 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 you ain't ready for change <laughs> Only you can make the changes Coming home in the paddy wagon Probably cause of the window you were smashing Then with your friends the next day at school bragging And maybe wagging with your pants swagging Talking about this and that Looking at your friends you wanna copy that Don't be a copycat Cause you will fall and stumble Can't trust anybody these days And then they get you in trouble Drinking grog, smoking drug Puffing and sniffing on the spray Damage you your lungs Letting in the chemical gas You ain't no gangster with your red and blue rags It's Australia, represent the flag In the darkness, trying to find my way Yeah, I keep my motion flow going To shatter that, got a lot going on My thoughts in my mind Making me blind, it's okay Let me freestyle, ass with my rhyme I hate it when the kids getting caught up Paving their life for crime Looking at you, you think it's a movie I know, goofy, I'm my dark side Trying to find the light Go home now and hurry. Stop making your mom and dad worry. Getting cop chase. Better tighten up your shoelace. Get ready to own up to your mistakes. Kids, parents going to prison. Parents, kids don't listen. Late at night, they're missing. Walking around town all night. Think you're cool, but you're a fool. You know that ain't right. Listen to this song, cause we made this. Underage kids getting locked up. We need to change this. Your favorite rapper Tupac said We need some changes Here's the message So take it And I hope one day You can make it too So that's the truth From me to you I hope you can get it through To your friends and family If you're with me Then stand with me Go home now And hurry Stop making your mom and dad worry Getting caught chase Better tighten up your shoelace Get ready to own up To your mistakes Go home now And hurry Stop making your mom and dad worry Getting cop chase Why to tighten up your shoelace Get ready to own up to your mistakes I wanna walk around town with anybody on me But now I gotta run when they coming for me I'm just trying to chill in harmony Cause everybody be telling me Breaking here, breaking there When you get locked up your friends won't care Now you got your moms on the knees and praise Let her not be forced, she goes to sleep Cause she loves and miss you heap Hoping nothing will ever happen to you When you're doing time cause your crew Make you do the crime, saying this from behind Make you full of regret Wishing you could rewind so you could reject all the bad things you did as a kid Let you live but you're doing what you did Follow in your footsteps when you smack the know What's coming up next when you're skipping the friends But that's all in the past now At the time of class now Negativity all around in this town Gotta be a role model before the grab now Got my boom ring happening My clap stick clapping My feet on my ground Gotta turn my life around Hey! Go home now and hurry Stop making your mom and dad worry Getting cop chase, better tighten up your shoelace Get ready to own up to your mistakes hey! Go home now and hurry, stop making your mom and dad worry Getting cop chase, better tighten up your shoelace Get ready to own up to your mistakes hey! Hello Year 11 and 12s, the senior school. I'm back today to teach you um, some integrated learning and some maths. And we're going to start with our integrated learning. Yesterday we looked at addictions and some substances and activities that you can get addicted to. Today we're going to look at um, what nicotine is, which is another addictive substance, and also the costs of smoking. So we'll get straight in to talk about nicotine. And I've just got a simple version here. So in our workbooks, we're on this page here, and it says, let me tell you about nicotine. Nicotine is, and I have done a simplified version of what nicotine is. So these are some things. Nicotine is a drug found in tobacco plants, and tobacco is what we find in cigarettes. It is highly addictive. Our body wants more, more, more. 
And nicotine is also a stimulant, so it makes people feel more awake, makes them feel alert, energetic and confident. So people want to have it to make themselves feel better and their body ends up needing it because it's addictive. Okay, so that's a bit about nicotine. Now, once nicotine gets into your body, your body's going to crave it. It's going to really want it and it can be really hard to give up, but not impossible. When you're giving up smoking, after using it for a long time, it can be really challenging because your body must get used to working without any nicotine in it. You can have some withdrawal symptoms and they can start within two to three hours after you last used tobacco. The symptoms could last for a few days or a few weeks. And some of these symptoms are, you could have cravings, like you just really want that cig cigarette. You might get a bit of a bad mood, anxiety, or a bit of depression. You might have trouble sleeping. You might eat more. You just need something to put in your mouth and um, distract you, and then you might put on some weight. You might have trouble concentrating, headaches, you might have some coughing and a sore throat, aches and pains in your body, or an upset stomach. These are just all short-term symptoms. The good news is these symptoms will pass, and they will just last for a little bit, and it's because your body is having to give up something it is used to. Okay, so some people use different things to ease off or withdraw from smoking so that these symptoms aren't as bad. And I've actually, we've got an idea here of one of them, it's Nicobate and it's a spray for the mouth with a little bit of nicotine in it. I've also got pictures of some other things you can use. So I'm just going to put this next to it and we'll go through them. So you can have... This is your mouth spray that we talked about, Nicobate. You spray it in, you get a little bit of nicotine, but it helps for your body to give it up. You can have lozenges, so something that you, like a cough lolly almost. With nicotine, you can have patches. You pop them on your arm. You can use gum, like chewing gum. There's also um, an app for your phone, and that helps document how many days you haven't had a smoke, and also looks at how much you save and how much tar you've got out of your body. And there's also a quit line. So this is a number you can call if you're really struggling and you can talk to someone and they can give you some ideas. So in this section here, we can add two more ways of giving up smoking. Some people also just go cold turkey and they give up on the spot. And that means they don't do anything. They just stop smoking and go through all the symptoms and um, hopefully give up. What would you do is the question there. And you've got some ideas around here. Next bit, um, what helps people beat an addiction? And we talked about a few of them yesterday. A major thing is to be open, honest and accountable to someone else that you are, and so that you are supported and encouraged with what might be the daily struggle to give up. It's hard. This person might be your friend, your partner, a partner or elder, a professional in the health area, that will help you stay on top and beat the urges to give in. So it's really important to have someone help you. Okay, we're gonna have a little look at some costs now. So I will turn over. Okay, now, in a minute I will get my assistant Emily to help me on the board, but I will just run you through what it says here on your worksheet. So the cost of smoking, it will cost you your money, your health, emotions, your time, maybe some relationships, and also the health of the ones you love. They breathe in your smoke. So there are a lot of things that smoking costs, but we're actually going to talk about the money today. So we'll do a quick calculation. All right, so. One of these packets, I've got a real packet of cigarettes here, is $50 per packet. $50. So we're going to do our first calculation. I'll just come and point to where it is on the worksheet. We're going to look at if you smoked a packet a week. So there's 52 weeks in a year and each packet costs $50. So we're going to put a sum up on the board, 52 times by $50 and work out what that is. So let's see, 52 times 50. Oh, 
I actually did the calculations before, and 52 times 50 is $2,600. So this is how much you could save if you smoked one of these every week, you can save $2,600. And that could be, you could get a second-hand car even for that. You could get uh, clothes, food, footy boots, so many things with $2,600. The next question on the worksheet is, what happens if I smoke two packets a week over the year? What would that cost? So the next sum we're going to do is, we're going to do 52 times two, so we're gonna do 104 times by 50, because each packet is $50. And I also did this before. <laughs> so this one is, no, not in your head. oh, no. <laughs> $5,200. <laughs> hey, hey, it's okay. <laughs> well done, Emily. Thanks. So this one, this is double the amount. So you could get uh, an even better car. You could get uh, a laptop. You could get a new TV, phone, so many things. $5,200 a year. Now there are some people, and I'll come back to the workbook here, some people smoke a packet a day, which is seven days times 52 weeks times 50. So you smoke a packet, one of these, every day for 52 weeks and you times it by 50 and it equals 18,200. So if you write that up here, $18,200. That's a lot of money. That's a deposit on a house. Mm. That's uh, a really nice car, that's holiday. a holiday, that is so many good things when you give up these. So this is just the money, not even your health, $18,200. That's how much a pack a day for a year, a pack a day for a year will cost you. Bit crazy really. It even says that, that is scary. Okay, I'm just going to follow up and read this last little bit you can put these calculations in. When we buy something that is broken, white fellas often say it's wasting money or that the money has gone up in smoke as it disappears with no good thing happening. When we buy cigarettes, it is like we are burning our money and it is really going up in smoke. So, that's all we're going to do with our integrated learning today. Tomorrow we will look at some of the emotional um, effects that smoking has. But uh, it's really good to think about the money that cigarettes are costing us. Thanks for your help, Emily. That's all right. And we will come back in a minute with maths.
Hello, senior school. We are back and we're doing some maths. So if you've forgotten which uh, workbook we're going from, we're going from uh, data and graphs. This is for senior class A and senior class C. Okay, today we're going to look at mean, median and mode. And I will show you in our workbook here. Okay, some of you might not have heard of these words before and today we're going to look at the mean. All right. So one way to get information from data that we collect can be to locate the middle of our data. The term average refers to the middle point or to a number that is a typical representation of a group of numbers or data set. These numbers can tell us how much our data is spread. Averages can be calculated in different ways. The main three ways we can measure the average and centre of data are mean, median and mode. And today we're just looking at what mean means. Oh, it's hard to say. Okay, so we have an example here and it's about Darwin daily temperatures, but we're actually going to do an example on Elliot, because we're missing all our students from Elliot, we're going to see what their highest temperatures are from today, Tuesday the 15th, to next week, Tuesday the 22nd. Okay, so before we do that, I'm going to go over to the board and explain what mean means. All right, so when you find mean in a set of data, it means the sum of all the data values divided by the number of data values. Okay, and that'll seem a bit confusing. You might not know what that means, but we're actually going to step you through it so you get how to find the mean. So first of all, we have to add all of our data values together. So I'm going to call out the temperatures from Elliot and Emily is going to write them on the board and then we will add them together. So are you ready, Emily? I'm ready. All right. <laughs> so the first temperature is 38. And she's going to put a plus sign because we're going to add 39 because that's our second one. Plus 38 plus 39. Okay. <laughs> plus 40. Doing really well. <laughs> It's very hot in Elliot. <laughs> yes. Plus 41. Two more to go. Plus 40. And plus 37. Okay, so come on, do it in your head, Emily. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> if you want to, do you want to use your phone to add all that up? Yeah. So what we've done there, I'm going to just come back to the Elliot sheet. We've grabbed all of these. Um, data sets. So these are all the highest temperatures in Elliot. The next thing after we've added them up is to divide them. So we did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight sets of temperatures. So we're going to add these all up and then we're going to divide them by eight. What did you get? 312. 312. All right. So that's what we've just done. We've just added all of the data values together to get 312. Then we're going to find the total number of data values. So how many values did we add up? And that was eight. Oh, you already counted. Yeah. So that's going to be our sum to get the mean, the average or the middle. We're going to do 312 divided by eight. And it is? 39. 39. So if someone said to you, what is the mean of the temperatures in Elliot over the last or over the next seven days, eight days, including today, it's 39 degrees. That is the mean temperature. Okay. So um, you can do this with lots of different things. You can do it with um, heights. You can do it with... Um, scores like in tests or in footy and you're just trying to find the middle amount All right and so today we got 39 degrees so the mean amount for Elliot is 39 degrees um, if we flip over now in your workbooks you've actually got 
some activities you can do here with just some random numbers. Now, I'm just going to read this so you know what we're working with. The mean value is, also, is often also called average, which we spoke about. Find the mean for the following sets of data. Show all of your working out. The first one has been done showing you how to set it out. We're actually going to have a go at doing B, and I'm going to get Emily to help me so you know where to start. All right. So, Emily, these are the new numbers you're going to write on the board. Thank you. All right, what is that? Beautiful. <laughs> The new numbers are two, seven, plus, plus. Yep, yep, plusing them, plus seven, plus five, two seven. Yep. Notice how you're going two, then seven, then five, then seven. <laughs> plus eight, <laughs> plus three. There's two more to go. Yeah. Plus one. <laughs> Plus seven. <laughs> okay. Great. So here we go. This is how you will lay it out on your page. All right. And um, do you want to work this out on your phone? While you do I that? Could, I could probably do it in my head, but just not today. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> not on your phone. <laughs> yeah, you guys do it in your head. This is just so it's a bit quicker for you to watch. <laughs> But, yeah. <laughs> what did you say? Uh, 40. All right. So, we added all the data values together. That's, what you, that's your first step. You have to add all those numbers together. And we got 40. So, if you just write 40 here, Emily. All right. Then we're going to find the total number of data values. So, we just go through and see how many numbers we added up. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight. So we have to divide 40 by eight. <laughs> you can do that in your head, but I can't. I'm just doing it in my head, but Emma's going to do it on the phone. I can't phone. do it in my head. <laughs> Five. Five. <laughs> so for B, we've worked out the answer. No, the mean of all of these data values is five. Okay, so that's how you're going to go. This is for B here on your page. Your answer will be five, but you'll lay it out like this. And then you've got one, two, three, four, five, six more to go. And I know some of you will fly through them. Right. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's maths for today. Good luck. Good luck. And, um, Tomorrow we're going to look at the median. Yep. Cool. So anyway, thank you for listening and thanks for helping me, That's Emily. Right. That was great. Thanks. Um, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. <laughs>Art lesson for this week. The task that I've set in your workbook is to draw a uh, self-portrait with sunglasses. So I'm just going to show you what that might look like. Uh, this is an example of a finished product and the way that I've asked you to do that, um, I've given you a few options. The first one is uh, following a step-by-step -step guide. So we're not all good at drawing and if you're not confident um, with your drawing then you can follow this step-by-step -step guide. The second way that I would do it and the way that I'm going to do it is by using a photo. So I printed out a photo of myself with sunglasses and I use this to do my drawing. Uh, the way I start is by drawing the sunglasses first and then I build my face around the sunglasses. So uh, the last thing that you'll need, because you might have noticed that there is a picture 
in the reflection or in the frame of the sunglasses. So what I've done is I've printed off a picture that I can use um, to draw the picture in the sunglasses. So let's make a start. Welcome back to your house. 